can turn. All right, can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Steve, for the great intro. Yeah, I'm one of the losers. I don't have type 1, so excuse me. Um, but I've been a diabetes psychologist for 35 years. I've had the chance to meet and work with thousands of folks living every day with type 1, and I've learned a lot from them. So I want to share some of the things I've learned. And as a psychologist, especially when I look at this title, it still amazes me. I meet so many people um, who are in the world of type 1 diabetes. Either they have it or they have loved ones who still say, uh, really? There's an emotional side of diabetes? Really? That's kind of... Especially this is true often of family members and friends. Like, what? What's the big deal? Just do what you're supposed to do. Get your act together. Um, but we know that's not exactly true. And if you're going to be able to be you know, successful, as so many of you are, and living well with diabetes every day, we have to take a look at this emotional side and figure out how do you really manage it and handle it and make it work for you as opposed to against you. But we know this can be a challenge. And one of the biggest challenges is when you think about this emotional side, how do I talk about that and share that with other people? And we can know that can be a problem because lots of times people might not get it or it can be a little overwhelming for our loved ones as well. <laughs> and so we want to think about this in two parts. One is like, so what's, what's going on? What is this emotional side and what do we do about it? And oh my God, of course, we could talk all day about that. Thank goodness I get to do some breakout sessions and I'll be here the whole time. I'm going to hopefully learn from so many of you what you've learned and what works for you. Um, so here's what we know about the elements of what it can be challenging when we think of the emotional side of diabetes. Now, none of this is going to be a big surprise to anybody here at all. But we just want to acknowledge what all of you know because what a weird experience is to be here because it's so rare that you realize, I mean, I'm not the only one going through this. There's other people. So we know that, number one, you know, the biggest issue, when we interview people with type 1 around the world, the biggest issue, and we say, what drives you crazy, although it's changed a bit over the years, is what we call, as you know, the 24-7 problem. I'm exhausted by this job where there's no breaks, there's no vacations, you get to do it forever. Even people on hybrid closed-loop pumps talk about this, right? So it can wear you down. We know that also it's easy to get discouraged, you know, when you don't have awesome glucose levels all the time. You know, I did the exact same thing today that I did yesterday. What do you mean things are bouncing up and down for no earthly reason? And sometimes it's unclear what it is, and you end up kind of beating yourself up for it. So we need to talk about that. By the way, is that familiar? Anyone ever felt discouraged with it? Oh, just want to make sure I'm in the right room. Thank you. So it looks like the majority of you understand. Um, we also know it's easy to feel down on yourself and even feel ashamed. Like, I'm sure many of you have gone to see your health care provider, and it's like, well, let's review your records and see how you're doing with your diabetes. And it's like, well, maybe you shouldn't look at those numbers, and maybe I'll just come back in a few months instead. But there is this kind of patronizing sense of, you know, I'm here to blame you and shame you, and we can do it, you can do it to yourself as well. Um, and again, as Steve and Jeremy mentioned, you know, diabetes, type 1 diabetes is so weird. It's very odd. You know, we don't blame and shame people, just like Steve said, for getting pneumonia or not taking perfect care of their blood pressure. But yet there's so much blaming and shaming. Like, why aren't you doing a better job managing your diabetes? It's, what, what's, what's going on? It's unnecessary. We also know it's easy just to get despairing and, steal, and start to feel hopeless and helpless that this disease is going to get me. How wonderful what you saw that quote that Jeremy put up, that you know we know that you can live a long and healthy life with type 1 diabetes. Boy, when I started in 1987, we definitely didn't know that. I still remember the first person who ever came to see me in my office. And uh, people would come to me. I had no idea why they were there. And he walked in and I said, how can I help you today? And he goes, well, today's my birthday. I just turned 30 years old, which is a really strange reason to go to see a psychologist, by the way. <laughs> and so being a well-trained, sensitive psychologist, I said, of course, happy birthday. Um, and I said, well, how can I help you? And he said, no, you don't understand. I was told I wouldn't live past the age of 30. What do I do now? I'm fine. You know. Um, <laughs> It was an odd way to appreciate the good news, but he had been, like many of you, had been told, this is not going to be good for you, right? So there, but there's still, there's still this sense of despair. This disease is going to get me. And so let's talk about that a bit as well in a minute. 
We also know, I'm sure many of you can appreciate, that despite our new technology, which some of you are on, some of you are not, there's an ongoing concern about lows. I mean, the number one thing that can haunt you and keep everybody from having awesome glucose levels all the time is an understandable, sometimes understandable, concern about lows. It can be scary, and it can be extremely scary. And we meet many people for whom their worries about lows runs their lives, what we call the hypoglycemic fear syndrome. So they tend to keep their blood sugars elevated all the time because they aren't just worried about lows. They've had such, often a ba oftentimes, a bad experience that they literally are having a, uh, what we call a phobic response, right? It's like being uh, uh, terrified of, of well, all the other things you can imagine someone being frightened of. But it, so they stay high because they're so desperately frightened that they ever, ever even remotely go low. And that's probably, at this point, the majority of the people who come to see me in my office, where they're really struggling. They don't want to have high blood sugars all the time but they're too scared to ever let their blood sugars get too low. And when I say too low, for most of my patients, it's like, oh my god, I certainly couldn't let my blood sugars drop below 200. Or, or I'm actually wearing a CGM, and oh, if I ever see a down arrow, oh my god, I better eat everything in sight, right? So it can run your life, this fears about love. So we'll again talk about that. The good news is, by the way, for all these issues I'm bringing up, we have solutions, right? We know that was ways of overcoming these and doing fine, like many of you have already discovered. Um, and then the biggie, of course, is sometimes all of these emotional challenges become so big that people just say, that's it. And we, we, they go through what we call diabetes burnout. And by, when you talk about burnout, it means things are so bad that they say, I, I'm just gonna, I'm checking out. Right? I'm gonna do the minimum. I'm not gonna really focus and pay attention to my diabetes. I'm just gonna ignore it as much as possible. It doesn't really matter what happens to me anyway. I'm just kind of doomed. My actions don't seem to make a difference. What the heck? And th this reminds me of a funny story I want to mention that years ago I had a publisher come to myself and a couple of our colleagues, and they said, we really want you to write a book, and we have a great idea for this book. And I got super excited because I love the title. And it was, called it, was, it was supposed to be called Diabetes for the Disengaged. And I went, wow, that is a really awesome title. And I actually put together a little content list of what we would cover. But then I realized something. I went back to the publisher and I went, you know, you're a publisher. You actually want to do this to make money. I'm not too worried about that, but you actually want to make money with this book. You do understand, you're asking us to write a book for a population of people who, by definition, are never going to buy it. So this is a crazy idea. And they went, oh yeah, never mind, forget it. Um, but it remains a big issue, right? I mean, it's a huge issue. And some of you might have been to this place where you just have said, I, I just can't deal with them any anymore. And thank goodness you, you're here, right? Um, so, and of course, it isn't just people with diabetes for whom there's an emotional sign. It's your loved ones. Again, family members and friends who are here today. And, there's, and we have a whole special session for you today, again, for folks with what Steve and Jeremy call type 3 diabetes. Sometimes I like to refer to them as the diabetes police, as many of you know, um, um, who always are coming from a place of love. That's why we call them loved ones. But they also can be extremely concerned. And one of their biggest concerns also is about fear of hypoglycemia. In fact, we've done many studies to show that family members and friends are more frightened about lows than most people who are living every day with type 1. They're way more freaked out. And it's often unappreciated how many spouses and partners in particular really suffer from significant insomnia because they're so worried about lows. Now, technology has helped a lot, but it hasn't really taken care of this as, uh, completely. How many family members know about being freaked out about lows, by the way? Anybody? OK, good. Um, so. So if any of this sounds familiar, the most important thing to tell you, this is normal. So all these sort of emotional challenges we re like refer to as what we call diabetes distress. And we know that if you've ever been struggling with any of these things, I promise you, I swear to you, this is normal. And that's probably the most important thing I want to say about this. Because again, many people who are have gone through periods of struggling with this emotional side of diabetes, don't realize how normal it is. They just think it's just me. Um, and when they discover, as you will discover throughout today and tomorrow, how many of us have been there, 
have struggled with the same things, it's such a huge relief to know that it's not just me. And of course, when I list all those emotional elements, I just picked a few, right? There's a lot more we can all think of. Things have changed over the course of years. You know, when I interview people now, here in the, you know, well, 2023, and I ask people what drives them crazy about diabetes, that one of the biggest things I hear that I certainly never heard before is having to deal with PBMs and insurance companies and getting my supplies covered month to month. You know, how many of you, I mean, I won't even ask you, but you know, month to month, I have to prove I have, I still have to prove I have type one? Are you kidding? I mean, really? Do you think it's vanished? Um, and we have, again, tons of research. We've been researching, I think our first paper came out in 1995 and learned about diabetes distress around the world. And we know that number one, it's extremely common. We know that high levels of diabetes distress um, occur in about 40 to 45% of people with type 1 diabetes. By the way, that compares to, say, significant depression or anxiety, which is a problem, but that's only about 8% maybe. So diabetes distress, high levels are extremely common. Um, and we know that there, one of the things that are important about is that they make managing diabetes more difficult. Okay? They, we know that high levels of diabetes stress are related to uh, uh, elevated uh, A1Cs, uh, poor time and range, things like that. By the way, I want to, well, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, by the way, if you're interested in, uh, well, I wonder how I would score, how, you know, how do I compare to other people? Is diabetes distress an issue for me? Um, if, you can, if you want to, you can always just go to this website. You can do it on your phone. You can do it right now, diabetesdistress.org, and it'll, it'll show you a little page like this, and you can fill out um, well, we have a lot of <laughs> diabetes distress scales now, but I think we only have two or three on, uh, available right now where you can uh, fill, out, um, fill it out and get immediate feedback, summary feedback about what's my score, not only how distressed I am, but what's driving me crazy and does that fit for me. And oftentimes it's very surprising to see these things. So I have, when I meet people, I usually have them fill this scale out immediately and I'm, we use this as a conversation starter, like, oh, now I understand better about what's driving you crazy. Tell me more about that. So feel free to check this out, or, and if you see some crazy score, you can find me anytime over the course of the next day and say, what's going on? Um, so it's one thing that could be useful for you. Um, again, I want to highlight, there is a very, very wide variety of people who are here today, right? So some of you are really struggling with the emotional side of diabetes. Some of you aren't thinking, what are you talking about, Bill? This is crazy, I'm fine. You know. We are pe people here today who are f here because they are way up to date with the technology of diabetes, they're ready to fine tune things. There are some people here who may not even know some of those um, uh, letters that you heard Steve and Jeremy talk about, right? Like, what does that CGM thing stand for? What does that A1C thing stand for? What's DKA? And we make the assumption that everybody knows those, but not necessarily. So, if you don't ask questions, please ask, say, what are you talking about? You know, this is a chance to get your questions answered here. But again, even with that emotional side, there's this huge difference, but we have such a chance to learn from each other. I thought I'd just mention how this is linked to outcomes just for this quote from one of our uh, old friends, uh, Stephanie. Stephanie Edwards works at Lilly. And she uh, was interviewed recently, and she said this, you know, sometimes the biggest obstacle to dealing with What's going on with my pancreas is to deal with what's going on in my head. So this emotional side often is very related to how am I doing? How, how am I, to what degree am I being successful with my diabetes? Now, um, Stephanie is someone who I bet if I ask Steve or Jeremy, they go, who is this Stephanie? I've never even heard of her. Why are, you not, why are you not mentioning some famous person? I've never heard of her. So Steve, Jeremy, uh, here's us with uh, Stephanie. Uh, at some bodega in Barcelona a few years ago, along with some of our other colleagues. But um, uh, this is someone who's just like everybody, everyone else here is, understands there's this link between my pancreas and how I think about this emotional side. So why is it such a big deal? Well, you know this. Number one is because living with type 1 diabetes every day is a job, as I already, seven, I already mentioned. You know it's this 24-7 issue where there's no breaks, no vacations. You get to do it forever, and it's a freaking balancing act, right? Where you don't want to have things to, your blood sugar is too low, too high, but it's that vigilance, it's that effort, it's having to think about it. 
Um, and again, I've been impressed with people on hybrid closed loop systems. As awesome as they are, for many people, it's more effort. Maybe the results are better, but you're even the thinking about it oftentimes even more. So we still have work to do, I think, to find that balance, as Jeremy mentioned, between wanting to have awesome results, but also not wanting to, have to think about this all the time. We also know that a big reason why the emotional di side of diabetes can be such a big problem is the old thoughts and deeply held beliefs we have about diabetes, which and how, what a big role they can play. Oftentimes these are things we learn when we're first diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. But there are things like you see here. Um, I meet people all the time, and the biggest thing going on with them is they feel like they have to be perfect with their diabetes. They say, whatever I'm doing probably isn't good enough, which gets to an important issue about how things have changed over the course of years over what is your target and your goal. People feeling still that my life's going to be cut short by my diabetes. There's no way I can live a long and healthy life. Like that first patient I met, you know, I'm going to lose years. And it's my fault if my numbers aren't quote unquote good. And of course, one of the biggest problems is we still keep calling glucose numbers good and bad, you know, or high and low. That's ridiculous. You know, I like to think of your time and range, your A1C, is simply indicating whether at this moment you're in a safe place with your diabetes or an unsafe place. But we need to throw out all the, the shame attached to things like good and bad. It's ridiculous. So what can you do about this? So, you know, we've been doing intervention studies again for 30 years, trying to look at exploring, and we've learned a lot about how to successfully address the emotional side of diabetes. But I thought I should approach you more humbly, and I said, look, well, I know a lot, but who else in the world can we turn to who might be able to tell us about the emotional side, who might know more than me and it might be helpful? And I thought about it and I realized there is one person who knows more and I thought I better check in. And that person is actually ChatGPT. <laughs> and so I went to ChatGPT and I asked this question. Hey, I got this big group of people I'm gonna to get to talk to. What are the most important things you'd wanna tell someone with type one about the emotional side? And oh my lord, good old chat GPT had a lot to tell me. But you know, the big ones are things that we've already talked about. We're going to talk about a bit more now. You know, uh, the fact that if you're having a tough time managing diabetes, those emotions are valid. The importance of having a healthy support system, people in your life who are rooting for you, appreciating the psychological impact that we'll get to, and being compassionate with yourself. And boy, the list went on and on. Chat GPT was just very verbose. Jeez, it just went on. Um, but I was glad to see that good old chat kind of agreed with me. So I thought that was kind of cool. It made me feel better about being with you here today. So here's what you can do. Number one, and again, I go, come to you with hum humility. Many have already learned this. Number one, get some freaking perspective about this. And again, I think we heard that all from Steve and Jeremy. If you've ever had a tough time managing diabetes, if you've ever felt discouraged and depressed and freaked out, welcome to the club, right? Everybody's been there. Again, when we have people fill out our diabetes distress scale, um, I can tell you from the times we've done this in big studies, we, we keep finding that no one seems to score zero on our measures. Everybody can tell you something. Oftentimes, when I travel around the world, I ask people, tell me one thing about diabetes that's driving you crazy. I've still never met anybody who went, I, I can't think of anything. I'm good. Thanks. So thanks. So, and again, I can tell you the majority of people I've seen over the, well, all the time, but especially over the past six months who come to want to see me and deal with any emotional issue, I say, you know what? You need to come to the one conference. You need not me. You need to meet your brethren, right? Your blood brothers, the people who know what's going on. What we're doing here this weekend, I think is the best thing ever. I love this. I'm so glad we're all back together. So, yeah. So, it's just, just so glad to see you all. So we want to chat and we want to laugh with each other about this crazy, crazy disease. And many of you are not shy, so I hope you'll, if you haven't had the opportunity already, you please take the risk of meeting other people who are around here today. Introduce to each other, say hello. Ask them what's driving them crazy about diabetes. And for those of you feeling a little uncomfortable, a little shy, maybe you're from out of town, don't realize what these crazy Californians are all about, Again, take the risk of just saying hello. And when I think about that, it's, it's sort of this mental set. You want to move from 
paranoia. I used to live on the East Coast, so I know what paranoia was like. You know, <laughs> presuming that everybody is out to get you, right? So don't take the risk of talking to everyone. To, in fact, moving to what is actually known in the scientific literature as not paranoia, but pronoia. And many have never heard the term pronoia. It's the coolest term in the world. Pronoia. It's that strange, creeping feeling that everyone's out to help you. <laughs> I want to live in that world, right? Isn't that cool? So you should be thinking about that throughout your time here today. Everyone in this room is out to help you. So please greet each other, say hello, meet someone new this weekend. It's the most important thing I think you can possibly do. Um, there's another important issue about when we think about getting some freaking perspective about that. And that's some, something else that Steve and Jeremy also talked about. Many of us seen, have seen way too many of announcements and things like this, right? Blindness. Diabetes is the leading cause of new cases of blindness among adults age 20 to 74. Okay, there's something I want to tell you about this and something I'm sure you're going to hear. I hope Steve, I can see you standing there. I hope you agree. This is wrong, okay? You may have heard this, diabetes is the leading cause of kidney failure. Actually, that's not true, okay? What is true is, well, out of control of diabetes is the leading cause of these issues, but well-controlled diabetes is the leading cause of nothing, nothing, <laughs> right? And in studies past, it's, it's nuts, right? So, now, usually I would come to Bori, I, have, I use the same slides all the time, where I, have, I present all the evidence. I go, look, here's the truth. Here's actually the evidence of what we really know. But I just couldn't do it again. Every, most of you have probably heard it, and then you're sick of it. But we know this is a fact. If you don't, we have a lot of experts here today. We can ask them all over and over again this one question. But let's be clear about this. The evidence is clear. This doesn't mean, as you see on the left side of your screen, that with good care that we can guarantee that you'll never develop complications. Or if you've already developed significant complications, that you won't get... But this does mean, with good care, odds are pretty good you can live a long and healthy life with diabetes. Period. Okay? We can say that here in the 21st century as a fact. When I meet people who are freaked out that diabetes is going to get them, I got to go, oh, that's so 20th century of you. <laughs> Because it used to be true, okay? But it is a new world, you know? And again, we have such a mixed group here. We have people here who have been complications-free for many years, or they're, and they're new to diabetes. There's other, other people who have been actually hit hard by complications, right? And, who, and are doing, and doing their best to live well, like Dr. Elman. So there's so many of us here, but there's the idea of what we call evidence-based hope is critical, that with good care, Odds are pretty good. We're all going to be fine. So, um, and don't even believe me. Again, we have, we have the top experts in type 1 diabetes here with us today. Let's just badger them constantly until you believe it. Um, we also know this is important. What you can do is you can give yourself a freaking break about this as well. You know, because of our technology, people, sometimes people feel like they've got to do, you know, 70% time in range isn't good enough, 80% might be better, 85%, oh, that's really what I need to aim at. How come I'm not at 90%? My goodness, even with our technology now, you cannot do diabetes perfectly, and you don't have to, right? That's what we talk about. What's your target? What's your goal? What are you trying to reach? How do you know where you can, when you can say, I'm in a safe place, or as safe as I can be or need to be, given this funny balance between I'd like to do as well as I can and I don't want to think about diabetes at all. And it's finding that middle ground that's really important. But you don't have to do it perfectly. You can't. And you don't have to do everything. You know, one of my, uh, a set of my colleagues actually put together this chart. They did this lovely report and they said, what are the, what's the stuff people living with a chronic disease like type 1 diabetes have to think about and do on a regular basis? What is that stuff? How is that unique? And they put this together in this chart, in this article they wrote, and they called it the taxonomy of burden, just to list all the extra things you want to do to stay healthy and well with type 1, uh, with, well, type 1 diabetes, but other illnesses, chronic illnesses. And that chart looks like this. Where is it? So, <laughs> now this is not a picture of a retina, okay? This is actually a list of all the stuff you should be thinking and doing on a regular basis. Now, you can't read this. And it's not because there's something wrong with your eyes. 
It's the print is too freaking small. I mean, I can't tell what this is, and I've used magnifying glasses. It is amazing. The bottom line is, I put this up here just to remind you. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff, but you can't do it all. We pick and choose every day. We're going to all do the best we can, but you don't have to do everything. You want to highlight some of those things that are reasonable for you, and that number one means: Do you have a target? Have have you and your healthcare provider sat down and say? What does it mean to be in a safe place with your diabetes? Maybe that's an A1C number, or maybe that's a time and range number, right? Or something else. How do you know when it's good enough so that you can relax? You know, I, uh, I've been talking a lot with some of you about what we call how the goalposts keep moving, right? Like, oh, if I'm doing this well, maybe I should do better and better and better and better. The lower, the better. The lower, the better. But eventually, maybe you're okay. And for many of us, we're uncomfortable with that. That's why it's important to talk to your healthcare provider. And since you can't do everything, when you're trying to make some positive change, it's way more important to think about well, what's one thing or two things I can do. The idea of doing one step at a time is what's critical. And when oftentimes people come to see me, they go, "Oh my God, I just don't even know how to approach this problem. There's so much I have to do." And really, what we have to do is figure out what's the one step that you can take that can make the biggest difference—the bang for your buck approach—as opposed to thinking of everything. Because if we start with just one thing, we're likely to be effective. And finally, the last thing I want to mention, which comes back to the first thing, is: my goodness, don't do diabetes alone. If there's one thing all of our scientific evidence shows, if you're ever trying to make and maintain a behavior change for anybody, whether you have type one diabetes or not, when you got somebody in your life who's rooting for you. Who cares about you? Just like many of you have here today, it's way easier to be successful. But of course, you want people in your life who are rooting for you and caring about you in the right way. Because many of you have people who are rooting for you and are caring about you way too much. <laughs> and that's where the issue of the diabetes police comes in, right? And so a lot of what we'll talk about today and hopefully even tomorrow is what does it mean to be. Uh, supporting your loved ones in a way that makes sense, right? That really is going to be helpful. That isn't too much. You know, we've moved from worrying about. Some of you may have seen our diabetes etiquette cards, which you can see online on our website.、Um, now we want to talk about、uh, Dexcom Share etiquette, right? So, what do you do if you're sharing and following your glucose numbers with someone else? So, but you want to people life when you care about you. You want to meet up with people who actually get it. Where would you find people like that? Oh, that's right, right here. So again, the by far the most important thing, if you want to begin to think about and address better the emotional side of diabetes, don't talk to me. Talk to each other.、Uh, meet someone new here today. Meet someone new tomorrow. Meet someone new tonight.、Um, talk to your friends. We all can learn from each other about what's driving us crazy, and what are the solutions that so many of you found. And I'm hoping today I'm going to learn from many of you, not just about what's been tough, but what you've all figured out. So again. If you're having a tough time managing your diabetes, you're not alone. It's sometimes it's nice just to hang out with other people who are just as feeling as miserable and overwhelmed as you are. <laughs> But that's the beginning of how we find solutions as well. So I just want to thank you for listening, and I look forward to talking to you, many of you later today. I'll be around in a couple of weeks. Thanks.